This week, we're on the hunt for the parrot pirates. You've missed a bit. How to spot when buildings go wrong. And the musicians taking on the streaming Scrooge. Here we go again. This week, Lara's doing something unusual. She's left the city to join someone special on a walk. And also, She's in the New Forest National Park with wildlife TV legend Chris Packham. What a beautiful scene. Tell me about this area. Well, we're in the New Forest National Park here, which is famous for various habitats. It's valley mires, it's sandy lowland heath, but also it's ancient woodland. And there are a number of veteran trees here, a significant number. So we're talking about trees that are five, six, six and a half, maybe even 700 years old. And because there's been woodland here for that amount of time, it means that it supports a lot of other life. There's a great richness of biodiversity. The bird fauna here is really important too. We've got a number of national rarities. You can hear the birds. This isn't a sound I'm used to living in the city. No, what have we got? Hold on. So we've got a bit of robin going. Uh, just blue tit, them. yeah, there's blue tits and great tits calling. I mean, it's a lovely sunny pre-spring day. They're loving the sunshine and they're pumping out some song. But unfortunately, not all birds are left alone in their natural habitats and wildlife trafficking mainly perpetrated online, is having a major impact on the world's biodiversity crisis. Carmilla has been looking at the problem. So we've had catastrophic declines of whole suites of bird communities. But there are large tracts of forest, but they're silent, they're silent forests because the birds have been trapped out of these environments. So trapped out, in fact, that 40% of all bird populations in the world are now in decline. To find out a bit more, I came to London Zoo, where some of these species have found a home. We have um, our blue crown laughing thrushes, you know, which are a species from China. There's less than 250 of those birds left in the wild now. We actually have more in captivity. The species is more threatened than a giant panda because of trapping for the pet trade. The illegal pet trade is a major factor in declining bird numbers. What may come as a surprise to many is that the most endangered of all groups of birds are parrots. What will be less surprising, though, is that the pet trade is a major factor in their decline. Einstein could sure fit the bill because she loves to dance. Can you get down? <laughs> Let's get down for everybody. Come on now. She's going to make me do it too. Ooh, 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 ooh. This is an African grey parrot, famous for its intelligence and the most popular one to be kept as pets. Even though many are bought in legitimate ways, their popularity fuels the illegal trade too. These birds have been almost wiped out in some of their native countries. So five years ago, they were given the highest category of international protection. It means all international trade of any wild African grey became illegal and there were serious restrictions on any transaction involving captive bred birds as well. In short, it became illegal to capture and sell African greys. So we went undercover to investigate how online trafficking still carries on under the radar, particularly on social media. We followed one of these ads which took us to Bangladesh, one of the major hubs in Southeast Asia for the trafficking of African greys. We set up a meeting with Fayaz Ahmed, a trader whose social media led us to investigate possible illegal activity alongside its illegitimate business. We operated under the pretext of wanting to start a breeding farm. <laughs> The conversation started over legal captive bred parrots, but Fires was also prepared to sell us wild African greys. 
He was confident that he would be able to get around customs import restrictions and also advised it would be a lucrative business. Recently, a global initiative was set up to understand the scale of the problem, and a new system was designed to give conservationists a data-driven view of possible illegal trades online. No one is able to give us a, a authoritative answer to how much of this is online and everywhere that it's occurring. It's too dynamic, the online space is too fragmented. The system's mission is to identify online trading hotspots in the hope of disrupting a business that's worth £15 billion a year. Although many online sites have worked to remove illicit content, the system has found around 10,000 classified ads all over the world for the sale of potentially endangered species and their parts. We showed our film to Rowan Martin of the World Parrot Trust, whose expertise in parrots and trafficking is helping the project's researchers. So Rowan, that was obviously undercover filming that colleagues of ours did in Bangladesh. What do you think of all that? A lot of those will be endangered species, but it might not necessarily be the illegal trade. The conversation switches from, from this sort of legal side of things to, to more, more grey areas where he's, he's offering up or explaining how he can, can import large quanti wholesale quantities of wild-caught African grey parrots into Bangladesh. <laughs> And that would be illegal under international law? Yeah, that would be illegal under international law. Back in Bangladesh, Fayaz was getting cold feet. He told us the authorities were getting stricter so the birds could still be imported, but he couldn't take responsibility for them at airport customs. When later called up by the film's producer in the UK, Fires at first denied offering to trade African greys and then claimed he didn't know that their import was now illegal. Our reporter contacted other sellers based in Africa and Asia and secured promises of shipments via transit countries. But for every one of these traders who we have highlighted, there are countless others using tricks online to avoid detection. They use clever things like sharing memories of something that maybe happened back when it was legal, uh, but that might then stimulate a discussion amongst traders about whether or not something was still available. So they might not have been directly advertising, uh, but just indicating that these, these things are available. Uh, or will specifically school people within these groups about how to talk about the trade without it being flagged. This is all made worse by the way in which social media allows pockets of communities to form who actively evade any enforcement efforts that do exist. They are using sort of new uh, private channels which might only be viewable to friends and only available for a short period. These platforms aren't just sort of passively hosting a problem, they're actually acting to amplify that problem. That's where the system is aiming to outwit illegal sellers by figuring out the tactics being used in specific markets. On these Indonesian posts, for example, is cracked a code of letters and numbers used by sellers to represent the asking price for each bird. And in other cases, it's found as slang familiar to enthusiasts, which might be used in possible sales, such as GTOT for a bird which is fully tamed and raw for those that are wild and in plentiful numbers. We showed some of the posts selling endangered birds to the platforms hosting them pointing out that in many cases their existence was breaking their own site guidelines and policies. Of those that responded, Meta, the umbrella company of Facebook and Instagram, said that they prohibited the trading of endangered wildlife or their parts, continually adapted their policies to keep up with new trends used by traffickers and proactively removed content that violated them. People are not going to huge lengths to hide behind uh, Tor browsers and on the dark web because they don't need to. And I've seen it for myself. I mean, these birds, they often get mutilated. Um, they're, they're crammed in these really crowded boxes, dying of dehydration. It's a slow, painful, miserable death for a lot of these birds. Back in the new forest, I asked Chris about the wider impact of the illegal wildlife trade. 
Well, we are in the middle of a climate and biodiversity crisis which is really, really seriously impacting on our lives, even if we haven't felt it here in the UK yet. So stamping out illegal wildlife crime is absolutely critical. The principal culprits here for me are not those poachers, sometimes people living in poverty that can't do anything but capture birds in the forest to feed their family. And tackling that part of the crime would be extraordinarily difficult. The easier part would be dealing with those platforms. They have the technological capacity to stop this, I believe, overnight, if there was a will. What do you feel that conservationists could do to help with this cause? Frankly, I can't write code. I don't understand algorithms. I understand birds and bird song. But in order to protect those birds and that bird song, I need young, smart people with their fingers on the buttons of that technological capability to act in our interest. I mean, frankly, if I had my finger in the conservation purse at the moment, I'd spend a lot more money on buying you know, more nature reserves, so on and so forth. I'd spend certainly a significant sum on tackling these tech-led issues because you know, we're underestimating how much damage they're doing and we've got to change that. Hello, it's time for your 90 second tech news roundup. It was the week India announced its intention to launch a digital rupee this year. China is already publicly trialing its digital run. Facebook's crypto project DM, once called Libra, has officially been laid to rest. And Sony announced it will buy video game developer Bungie, famous for series like Halo and Destiny, in a deal worth $3.6 billion. Spotify will add content advisory warnings to podcasts containing discussions about COVID-19. It's in response to concerns over spreading misinformation. Veteran artists Neil Young and Joni Mitchell wanted their music removed, as the platform also hosts the controversial Joe Rogan podcast. The aviation fan who built a bot tweeting Elon Musk's flight plans has rewritten it to support other rich people's personal planes. Flight plans that aren't sensitive are publicly available, but Elon DM'd Jack Sweeney to offer him $5,000 to stop, citing security concerns. The 19-year-old said he was holding out for $50,000, but would also delete the Elon Jet account in exchange for a Tesla internship. Right, time for the end finally, and most of you probably know by now that those grey, yellow and green squares showing up in our social feeds is in fact the daily web-based game Wordle. Well, this week the New York Times bought it for an undisclosed sum in the low seven figures and has said the game would initially remain free. So go on then, what's your starter word? Uh, it feels nice at the moment, you know, I've had worse things on my head over the years. I'm here at Digital Construction Week in London's Excel Centre, which features some of the industry's newest tech. So it's the world's most accurate augmented reality device, so we're able to position it to engineering precision. David Mitchell is one of the founders of XYZ, the company behind these augmented reality headsets specially created for the construction industry. If you think back to your school days, you might remember these. These are 2D elevations of a complicated bit of 3D engineering. And the idea is that the construction workers look at these plans and then build it in the real world. But apparently, they don't always get things right. And my job is to go onto the site and see whether they stuck to the plans or not. I would like to ask you, what do you see? And do you see any deviations from, between the design, which is the hologram, and what's built in reality. So maybe if you have a walk around and see if you have any spot the difference. And I have to say, it becomes immediately and shockingly obvious that some of the pipe work here doesn't match the augmented reality version. Some of the pipes are a few centimetres out. They're what's called out of tolerance. Even worse, some valves are pointing in the wrong direction and some aren't even there. And what you're able to see is the model and what actually happened in reality. I found another one. Absolutely. Right, they got the hoofa doofa was supposed to come off here. Yes. And they put it round this way. Now it becomes really obvious how those 2D drawings yes. 
can be more confusing than seeing it in real life. Absolutely. But throughout my career, I just became obsessed with why are we still using 2D drawings? And, and I just found that it was the 2D drawing process itself that was introducing these areas. Because it's limiting, right? Yeah, I mean, we went out and we did a, a study of, you know, exactly how much of works are built out of tolerance. Yeah. And we found that up to 80% of construction works is built out of tolerance. So built slightly in the wrong place, I wish it was slightly. So not by 5 to 10 mil, by 200 to 400 millimetres, which is a substantial amount. Apart from mistakes and misinterpretations, there are many decent reasons why building work may have to deviate from the plans, depending on the realities of the environment. But the important thing is for a construction manager to be able to walk the site and spot those deviations and decide whether they or the plans need fixing. Hang on. We've got another pipe problem, look. <laughs> right, there's another pipe that's supposed to be going that way. And they made it go that way. Um, oh, hang on. Well, there's a, there's a pipe that's supposed to be going there and it's not, it's not here at all. Exactly. Well, they've forgotten to put in the pipe. Yeah, or there was a change made on site where they decided to go elsewhere. And once this is handed off to the next trade or the next set of work starts, because they're deviating from the design, that has a knock-on impact on the rest of the build process. And, and that wouldn't be spotted until when, normally? Until it's too late, typically, <laughs> <laughs> if we're being serious about it. Unlike other augmented reality headsets, the XYZ system uses these lasers to sweep across the site and precisely locate all of the helmets. This then taps into the site coordinate system to put the AR building exactly where it should be in your vision. So would you sign off this piece of work? No, they forgot to put the thing in. <laughs> this is just shoddy. This is shoddy. <laughs> Building buildings is a large, complicated, messy business. And it's been a surprise to find out that things don't always go to plan, literally. But maybe with a system like this, we'll see fewer missing hoofa doofas in the future. Hoofa doofa? Technical term, move on. <laughs> OK, now, the modern music business is defined by technology, from the way that our favourite songs are created right through to how we listen to them. But one key part of the industry, namely how people actually get paid, is still playing catch-up, as Paul Carter has been finding out. What is the music industry? Famous stars, hit songs, streaming services, record labels or money. People making it, people wanting it, or fighting over who has the right to it. But often behind all the hit songs which you know and love are often a team of people you don't. Musicians, producers and audio engineers all helping to make a track. For doing this, they earn royalties. Money paid each time a track is played on a streaming service, on the radio, or on TV. In 2021, the UK Music Rights Society, PPL, which collects this money, paid out £229 million of royalties to artists. But in the same year, the US music rights group, MLC, put aside a whopping $424 million of so-called black box money. The actual name for the black box money is unidentified money. There's money coming in, but there's no way of finding out where the money should go. So while the big artists might make millions of dollars off a track, some musicians, producers or composers who help bring it to life in the studio miss out because they can't be identified or the paper trail has got confused. It's so easy for all that information to go out the window and you're like, oh, what was that person's surname? Or, and, you know, I've had personal experience of writing a whole song with someone and then at the end of the day realising I only knew their pseudonym or like their artist name, not their real name. And the money just sits there, waiting for someone to claim it. But one company may have come up with the answer. And of course, it's tech. Session is a tool that helps creators to capture all the important data around who did what, where and when, when you create music. All the data that is needed later 
to be able to pay the creators if there's money for, uh, coming in for this song and also to credit the creators when the, the song is out on the streaming services. It's a very different approach to how it currently works. Normally it would be a bunch of publishers or managers or agents after the fact scrabbling about trying to work out who was in the room, what date, what was the song title, um, who actually wrote that song and it's an absolute nightmare. You can imagine how inefficient it is to try and find that information out afterwards. It's almost impossible. But with Session, when a musician arrives at a studio to make a recording, they scan a QR code to sign in. Each musician has a unique identifying number, and this is automatically assigned to the tracks they work on. My view on the problem is that we must go to the source. If we feed a music industry with a lot of different platforms and databases with the wrong information, it will still be wrong. So capturing the data here with Session solves so many problems downstream. In some ways, it's a simple idea. But joining the dots between the many parts of the music industry attracted the legendary Bjorn Orvaeus of ABBA to invest in the project as he believes it could become even more important. I think that there is no reason why not every song that is injected into the digital system should, shouldn't have the relevant codes and the identifiers. When that happens, uh, then everyone will get paid. And it's simple as that. And I, I, I realize, I understand the plight of, of the songwriters today. Um, with 50,000 songs coming into Spotify every day. And I just want to help. So while this app may not be the answer to increasing the levels musicians get paid, or even changing how much of a track they're worth, what it might do is make sure that money which could support artists doesn't go missing. And for some musicians, Keeping the money flowing may be one way to keep the music alive. Paul Carter there talking to the legendary Bjorn Olvaeus about... Money, 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 must be funny in a rich man's world. And that's all we've got time for this week. As ever, you can find us on social media, on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. In a rich man's world. Bye-bye. Thank you.